Orchestra. And with that, I want to welcome our next speaker, uh, Dr. Bud Mayfield. So Dr. Mayfield is a research entomologist with the USDA Forest Service Southern Research Station and a member of the Insects, Diseases, and Invasive Plants Work Unit. He is a graduate of Yale University, West Virginia University, and the State University of New York. And he spent seven years as the state uh, forest entomologist for Florida Division of Forestry before starting with the Forest Service in 2010. His research focuses on the biology and integrated pest management of non-native invasive insects, including the application of chemical, biological, and silvicultural tactics to forest health problems. And um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, get to know uh, uh, Bud a little bit um, through Laura Wilt in particular. So when it was first detected, um, uh, yeah, met Bud at one of those locations and got to see firsthand um, the uh, symptoms as well as the, the insects that are vectoring this pathogen. Uh, so, so thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Bud. Great, thanks for having me, Ellen. And I just wanna say those were really excellent videos. Kudos to you and Alexandra and everybody that worked on those. That's a really quality, uh, quality videos that will continue to help people. Um, for uh, years to come, I suspect. So, so excellent. Well, hopefully, I hope it doesn't spread, right? That's always the hope. <laughs> um, but if history is any lesson, it will. And that's, that's what you're going to talk with us a little bit about that's today. Great. That's, a, that's a great segue indeed. Yeah. So sometimes these things, when they come to a new state, it just feels like, wow, where did this come from? Did it just fall out of the air? And so I'm going to try to help give us some context for that today. I'm going to turn my video off. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I'm going to give us a little walk down memory lane here and um, give you some background about where Laurel Wilt got started and how it got to Kentucky and, and hopefully some things in between. I want to um, acknowledge that this, a lot of my slides are part of a presentation I gave about two years ago um, at the Southern Forest Insect Work Conference and my uh, co-authors listed here uh, contributed a lot of the photographs and information that I'll share. And uh, I'm primarily for the history part of it, I'm gonna focus on these early years of 2002 to 2009, um, when the disease was first discovered in North America and as it, as it initially spread out and into other states. And so here are some of those folks that, that helped contribute pictures and information um, as well. So uh, how did this get started? Um, one of the projects that the US Forest Service um, has put on for a number of years, started as a pilot project back in 2001 called the EDRR, the Early Detection Rapid Response Program. And it was a program designed to detect non-native bark beetles and ambrosia beetles in the United States. And why that group? Well, one thing about bark beetles and ambrosia beetles, as you've probably gathered already from those videos, is that they're easily transported in wood. And as such, they're often introduced worldwide through the movement of solid wood packing materials such as crates and pallets and, and dunnage and so forth. And so um, they're very good world travelers. As um, Ellen said in her video, they're also fungus farmers. So they're carrying their fungi with them. And so many times all they need is a dead and dying host in the country where they land and you can get an established population. So the Forest Service made detection and response to these beetles a, a priority, established this pilot trapping program. And uh, one of the places where these traps were placed at the pilot project was near the port of Savannah. And actually this first uh, capture of the red ambrosia beetle was in Port Wentworth, Georgia, just north of the port of Savannah back in 2002 by the Georgia Forestry Commission. And Bob Rabalia, who was part of that, the lead person on that EDRR pilot project, Bob identified those beetles as Xyleberis glabratus with some help from the Smithsonian Institute. It was a new North American record, never seen on the continent before. And you might think, wow, we've known about this since 2002. Why didn't we just go in and scorch earth the, uh, the port and get rid of these beetles and be done with it? Um, well, so a follow-up delimiting survey was conducted. This was just a few beetles in a trap. You can see the three specimens listed down there at the bottom. Um, 
And the follow-up surveys yielded no additional beetles. Those follow-up surveys were done with ethanol baited traps. As it turns out, this beetle is not attracted to ethanol. Uh, they actually just probably ended up in those initial survey traps by random chance. They bumped into the trap and fell in, not because they were attracted to the ethanol lure. And at that time, there were no known connections with any tree problems. Uh, so you, it was like you couldn't go out and, and cut down the trees and chip them up. You didn't even know there was a problem. So at that time, it was suspected that, well, these beetles came into the port just like beetles often do, and they ended up in a survey trap, and, and that's it. There was no known establishment. So in the following year, there was red bay mortality. And if you're not familiar with red bay, um, it's also in the laurel family. It's, a, it's typically a mid-story to understory tree. It's very shade tolerant. Um, it's evergreen. It's an evergreen broadleaf in the coastal plain. People started noticing this tree dying on Hilton Head Island. And you can see some of the clips of the newspapers local papers here saying um, the red bays are dying and it's prompting some study. And there's lots of speculation about what's causing this. You can see even in some of the newspaper titles, five-year drought affects the native red bay trees and um, fusarium cankers and saltwater intrusion. And people were given their best guesses and it's easy to, to poke fun at it now, but um, you know, when something new happens, you're trying to find answers. And so these were some of the hypotheses that were being posed and it led to, um, to some further investigation. 2004 was really a turning point in this. And there was a Northern Research Station scientist in the Forest Service who was actually on vacation in Hilton Head. And she uh, saw these dying red bays and she emailed her friend, Steve Frederick, who's pictured here. He was a forest pathologist with the Southern Research Station Forest Service and uh, recently retired. And she said, Steve, what's going on with the red bays on, on Hilton Head? And uh, so Steve went down there to visit Hilton Head in 2004. He's chopping up trees and cutting into trees and he finds some ambrosia beetles and sends them to Bob Rabali and says, hey, what are these beetles? And guess what? They're those beetles that were trapped two years earlier uh, at the Port uh, Wentworth. So finally, this beetle is detected in a tree a dying tree, and Steve is also able to isolate the fungus from the wood samples of those red bay trees. And now this mortality is not only on Hilton Head Island, but it's being detected in Georgia. So this is the beginnings of, uh, of getting some answers to, to this problem. And uh, I really look at Steve as kind of the godfather. He's like the Gandalf of Laurel Wilt, and it, it's too bad that he's retired. We tried to talk him out of it, but you know, it just, it usually doesn't work. So Steve, uh, thank you so much for, for all that you've done for this, um, our knowledge on this disease and continue to do. Um, so at that time, uh, really started a lot of collaboration. The wheels started to turn and many people uh, from local, state, federal agencies and universities began collaborating. One of the people who was brought in was Tom Harrington from Iowa State. And uh, Tom is also a plant pathologist and he was the first person to recognize that this fungus is an ophiostomia, ophi ophiostoma-like fungus and probably a uh, symbiont fungus of the beetle, something that the beetle is carrying and farming as its fungi in the host. Um, Steve and the folks with Southern Research Station in Athens began studies on, on the uh, pathogenicity and the ability of the beetle to transmit the fungus. And a lot of people think that, oh, this is a new occurrence that laurel wilt is occurring in sassafras. And in some ways it is because the disease is now further north than it's ever been. And it's showing up uh, largely in sassafras. But we've known about laurel wilt and sassafras since 2005 uh, when it started showing up in coastal Georgia and Florida in sassafras. Um, and so as I, as I just alluded, it wasn't long before Florida got in the game. And uh, that's me there at the top left of the, of the photos when I wore a younger man's clothes. And, and it was a really exciting time uh, to get involved in a, in a new non-native invasive plant problem. Um, and we found it for the first time near the port of Jacksonville, which like Savannah is a huge international port. And it was a question of, well, did we get a separate introduction of it in Florida? Because there were um, 
you know, tens of miles of coastline um, between the nearest known spot in Georgia and where we were finding it at the port near the port in Florida. Uh, as it turns out, that was not a separate introduction. It's just spread of the existing population. And so um, this began kind of that multi-state, multi-county level map. It had very humble beginnings here as a, as a Florida Division of Forestry map with three states, um, but it has unfortunately expanded to, um, to at least 10 states now and, and continues to grow. So uh, the following year was really fruitful. There's Don Dewar with uh, Forest Service FHP, um, was able to provide some funding support and get some survey and monitoring going in Georgia. Um, Chip Bates there doing uh, some of what you saw Ellen and, and Alexandra doing and uh, figuring out where this disease is in the various states. I uh, came up with a common name for the ambrosia beetle, uh, the red bay ambrosia beetle, since it was first found in the tree red bay. And then uh, producing a lot of the things that Kentucky now is doing, uh, state level pest alerts and workshops and trainings. There was even a suppression effort on Jekyll Island, Georgia, and it was a valiant effort by the state as well as the uh, Jekyll Island Authority to go in and cut down and chip up all the uh, dead and dying red bay trees and try to eliminate it from the island since it was surrounded by water, perhaps you could, um, you could cut down the infestation and limit it to the island. That was unfortunately not the case. The disease was very widespread on the island, but by the time they started this suppression effort, and uh, it's difficult to know whether it would have worked if they, you know, if they had been able to get an earlier start. Uh, they started as early as they could, um, but it, is, it was one effort that was, that was tried to eradicate the beetle uh, from, a, from a localized area. And then at that time, um, some other rare hosts began to be confirmed for the disease. Pond spice, which is a, is a wetland shrub, as well as pond berry, which is endangered uh, at the state level in, in some uh, areas. These began to show up as hosts of the disease as well. In 2000, also in 2006, uh, started to look at the biology of the beetle and its flight. Uh, what, what it's attracted to. So Jim Hanula and his uh, associate from um, uh, China there, Dr. Sun, began to look at um, attraction of the beetle, what kinds of lures and chemicals were, were attractive to it. Um, began to examine beetles and found out that the fungus is carried in the mycangia or these sacs. So mycangia are just kind of like pouches on beetles that carry spores a fungi, and in the case of the red bay ambrosia beetle, those pouches are in the mouth parts of the insect. So you can see from this, uh, from this uh, slide. And Steve's lab really began testing the pathogenicity of the pathogen on various plant species, both within the laurel family and outside of the laurel family. They did it with um, injections of spore suspension into plants, as well as allowing beetles to bore directly into plants. <clears throat> we also began to get some information about how the mortality of this disease progresses in a forest. And uh, this is some plot monitoring that we did in Florida in Red Bay, where we began to notice that it was the largest diameter trees in the stand that die first and reach 100% mortality more quickly than the, the lower di smaller diameter classes. And it, as it turns out, this is actually related to the beetle itself having a visual, uh, using the stem diameter as a visual cue. So the beater, beetles see larger trunks and they're more readily attracted to large trunks. As um, Ellen and Alexandra port pointed out though, because the patho pathogen can move underground for clonal species like sassafras, this has really meant that even small diameter sassafras material can succumb to laurel wilt. But as an infestation gets started, as beetles come into the area, you are likely to see the larger diameter sassafras dying first and then progressing into the smaller diameter trees because of that beetle preference for bigger trees. Back in 2006, I reached out to Jorge Pena, who was uh, with the avocado program with the University of Florida in South Florida. And uh, Jorge came up to North Florida, took a look at this, and he was very concerned. We, we truckloaded um, 
potted avocados and planted them up near uh, Jacksonville, uh, near the port, and uh, began to realize that even avocado is going to be attacked by these beetles and, and transmit the disease. And Jason Smith was a new faculty at Florida at that time getting involved. We also did some work looking at tree protection. So we um, infused red bay trees with propiconazole. And um, although we were able to protect trees for a short period of time from developing the disease, as you can see, this is kind of an invasive um, treatment itself on the tree. You drill holes in the root flare and infuse large volumes of uh, fungicide into the tree. And um, it does not stay in the wood for years on end. You would have to do this repeatedly to protect trees. And so while this might be a short-term solution for particularly high value trees, um, it's not going to be something that you can do on a large scale uh, over time. So the, all of this culminated in a meeting, much like the one we're having today, um, on Jekyll Island in 2007 with lots of participants and everybody just kind of came together and what are we learning? What, have, what do we know about this disease already? Um, let's go out and look at it in the field, just like Ellen announced that y'all will be doing here in a, in a week or so. And uh, here's a little bit of the agenda <coughs> that was uh, presented at that conference. And one of the talks that you'll recognize actually uh, proposed a name for the disease. That was by Tom Harrington. Um, so that day back on January 18th, 2007, that's when the disease was named, um, named Laurel Wilt. It just kind of got adopted at that time. All of that led uh, to some more good research and, and publications. And so all of this uh, was first started to pull together into a recovery plan back in 2009. And this was a request of the National Plant Disease recovery system that um, is primarily focused on agricultural pests of concern to the US food system, but they also are expanding that program into um, other uh, pests and diseases of economic importance. And so they asked for a plant, uh, a plant disease recovery plan, both for Red Bay, uh, for Laurel Wilt and avocado, as well as into um, impact on forest species. And so, uh, many of us gathered together and wrote that initial 2009 recovery plan, and it was updated in 2015. Mark Hughes took the lead on that update, and there's a, a screenshot of that, of that publication. And really still today, even though it's six, seven years old now, that publication has a lot of good pictures and summary of the history and um, the, the research and development up through to 2015. I encourage you to go look at that um, that publication, it's in Plant Health Progress. Mark Hughes is the lead author, 2015. So um, how, did it, how did it get to Kentucky? As you can see here, these are um, just some periodic range maps of Laurel Wilt showing here at the top left, the point of initial introduction of the beetle back in 2002 near the Florida, South Carolina border on the coast. Uh, by 2004, Red Bay mortality was showing up throughout several counties in South Carolina and Georgia. By 2006, we not only had it in North Florida, but we also had it down in Indian River County, Florida. And that was almost definitely um, a movement of infested wood that got it all the way down there, 100 miles or more of coastline with no evidence of the disease at all, despite plenty of Red Bay along the coast during that stretch. So that was, that was almost certainly movement of infested wood down to Indian River County. And as you look at the distribution of this disease from that point on, you will continue to see these outlier jumps over into the Panhandle of Florida, over into Mississippi. By 2018, you can see that there are disjunct populations in Alabama and Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana. So we have definitely been moving this this problem by wood, bringing us to 2021. And as Ellen and Alexandra said, it was actually first detected in Kentucky in 2019 up here, right along the border with Tennessee. That was almost certainly, again, uh, movement of wood rather than natural movement of beetles across hundreds of miles of forest and, and no evidence of it in between. So um, 
you can see that the disease is now distributed almost all the way across Tennessee from the Mississippi River over to near the um, border with Virginia and um, also up along the uh, border of Indiana. So I, I don't think it's a very risky prediction for me to say that this disease is going to show up in 2022 when things start leafing out again uh, and the wilt shows up. You know, this time of year, it's gonna be tough because um, Plants are already showing their fall color, especially further north, and uh, it would be it's going to be tougher and tougher as the uh, weeks go by here to detect new infestations. But in 2022, I think it's very likely that this disease will be seen in um, in some of these more northern states like Missouri and Illinois and Indiana, maybe West Virginia and, and Virginia. So um, yeah, keep keep an eye out, and like Ellen and and Alexandra said. Um, more boots on the ground and eyes on the trees, uh, the better for keeping track of where this disease is. And a shout out to all the folks who, who um, contribute to this map and, and try to make it complete. Um, and as Alexandra and um, Ellen said, the focus of new detections now is really in the range of sassafras. We've moved, it's moved out of the range of Red Bay uh, into the range of, of where sassafras and spicebush are really the only two hosts that we know of that are capable of uh, perpetuating this epidemic. There you can see dead and dying sassafras in, in East Tennessee. Um, the spicebush samples that Alexandra showed earlier. And I also want to thank Alexandra and James Morris who've been monitoring red band ambrosia beetle flight in uh, Christian County, Kentucky at two sites. Uh, for well over a year and a half now. And I just wanted to um, show some of these data. Uh, I have a more complete set than this. It just isn't all, all graphed up in Excel like I would like. But um, as you can see, this beetle is flying for a good portion of the year. Um, it stops flying in late October, early November, and starts up flying again in uh, early April and then flies really all summer. There's kind of a peak, peak of flight between June and August, and things slow down a little bit as you get cooler. But um, even in 2020, continue to trap this beetle into early, very early November. So um, it's, got a, it's got a long flight period in Kentucky. I'm gonna close out here with just some of the things that I think are, are challenges to managing this disease complex. Um, for one, the new detections are often old infestations, and anybody who works in forest health knows this, that sometimes by the time you find something on the landscape, it actually could have been there for quite a while. And um, that certainly contributed to this disease, um, you know, perpetuating and getting out ahead of, of uh, any control efforts. Also, one female beetle is all that's required to get um, an infection started in a tree. Uh, very small amounts of the pathogen, both sassafras and red bay are very susceptible to um, the pathogen as is, is the spice bush. You don't need beetles mass attacking a tree like you would a southern pine beetle on a pine tree. Just, just a little bit of the pathogen in that tree is enough to kill it. Also, one female beetle is enough to get a new population started. The beetles are um, partially parthenogenic, so if a female doesn't mate, she can lay haploid eggs that will hatch as males. And then those males can mate with um, the parent or with siblings that are also present in the tree. And you can get a new population started um, with just a single foundress beetle. So it's really, um, it's really a tough uh, scenario. Most beetles actually are, by the time they mate, by the time they fly and leave their, the tree that they were born in, they're actually already mated um, by males that occurred in that, in that natal tree. So um, by the time they're flying, they're usually already uh, ready to lay female eggs in the, in the new tree. Females are able to find geographically isolated trees. And I say females because females are the only ones that can fly. The males are flightless and remain in the tree. The female beetles can find trees, as we said before, out on islands that are several miles off the coast. Uh, they also seem to to somehow show up on isolated trees in the middle of the woods. You know, why this tree and not, not the 20 others that, that it could have hit before it hit this one. Um, they find isolated trees. There's no evidence for a pheromone, which has been one of the things that makes it difficult to trap for this insect. 
the best that we have at this point are host-based lures that only attract the beetle at a very close range. And it's why the survey efforts for this problem are primarily focused on looking for symptomatic trees and not um, a, a big trapping grid, because you're, you're actually very more likely to find uh, an infestation by looking for dead sassafras trees and confirming it by putting traps there or taking samples like Alexandra showed, rather than just trapping in unsymptomatic forest type. Uh, you're just very likely to not, to not find the beetle trapping that way. Most of the life cycle is in the tree, and so the beetles are easily moved in wood. As we said, sassafra in sassafras, the path pathogen can spread underground. Uh, there's low economic value for these forest hosts, even though they're lovely trees, they have ecological and cultural importance. We're not sawing boards or making a lot of timber products out of um, sassafras and spice bush, and so they don't attract a lot of commercial attention, and there's often not a lot of clamoring for, hey, let's, let's uh, put a lot of money into stopping this problem. So um, sometimes that, that hinders the effort. And um, the hosts are usually not completely eliminated, at least in Red Bay. The, um, the trees are still around at small diameter and beetles can remain in the stand even after an epidemic has, has largely ended. So um, what do you do about it? And uh, Ellen is right in her video that there isn't any silver bullet, surefire way to manage this disease. And I have this slide that I would say it's potential. It's potential management tactics. It's, it's not tried and true and proven, but they are things that we can do, that we can try and continue to develop to, to help manage this disease. One is to not move firewood around, especially wood that's coming from an area that's infested with laurel wilt, uh, and certainly not laurel family plants. Also don't sell and transport symptomatic plants. We talked about sanitation a little bit in the video. And um, chipping up wood can reduce the numbers of beetles that are coming out of, of that wood. If you were to do this successfully on an area-wide scale, you'd have to have lots of people participating in it. It wouldn't help you to chip up your trees, uh, but your neighbor is not chipping up their trees or the person three properties over is not chipping up their trees. So this would really have to be done on a coordinated effort, maybe a piece of public land, and still not necessarily um, effective uh, as that Jekyll Island experience uh, showed. So uh, it, would, it would take a lot of coordination and focus to, to pull something like that off, I think. Chemical control has been um, examined a little bit. Insecticide options are really of limited or no efficacy, uh, at least at this point. Fungicide infusion has been um, tested, as we said, on red bays. And there's been some recent research out of University of Florida looking at semiochemicals. So um, verbenone, which is a, a, a semiochemical common in, in the bark beetle realm, uh, has been shown to repel red bay ambrosia beetles and reduce the number of attack, attacks on red bay trees. And so you can, you can put a glob of it on a tree and it puts out an odor that repels the beetle. Um, as far as I know from reading this study, it did not eliminate attacks on the trees, but maybe this is something that can be used as part of an integrated pest management program in, in co combination with other tactics. And uh, as a lead in to Tyler, who I think is going to be our next speaker, um, just like to point out that there has been some research on host resistance. Uh, Mark Hughes, who I mentioned earlier, did his PhD looking at the potential for resistant red bay in populations where the pathogen had moved through, killed almost everything except a few trees. And Mark went and took cuttings from those trees, grew them up and, uh, and planted them out and has detected some resistant genotypes that way. And so Tyler um, also has a funded project looking for that, using that same tactic in sassafras. And uh, he, he may talk about that some in his talk. So, I've probably run over a little bit, but just want to say thanks um, for having me as part of the workshop. And if you need to reach me, there's my email. We do have a Forest Service pest alert on Laurel Wood. You're welcome to use it, print it out, and, uh, and send it out. And uh, just give me a holler if I can be of help. And uh, it all seems kind of new when it's in a new state, but never fear. There's uh, some of us old, old timers that uh, have been down this road before. So thanks.